Welcome in, and I am so excited to introduce our guest today on the podcast, Aswath Demoteran. He is a professor of corporate finance and valuation at the Stern School of Business at NYU. We went into so many different topics today, ranging from current valuations, his process, his very interesting take on reading, I found that most fascinating, and different things about different CEOs, ROIC, all of the things that we talk at regularly on the channel. I hope you enjoy. Okay, so um, first question. One thing I'd like about your process, and correct me if I'm wrong, is we're big believers on keeping it simple, stupid. And I believe that you are of the same mentality, that you feel that a lot of investors like to overcomplicate with a lot of analytics and so many data points and so much thinking. And we tend to just say, hey, here's my process. Do I think this company will be around for 10 or 20 years? Do I think they'll make more or less revenue and profit 10 or 20 years from now? And can I buy it for a reasonable price today that factors those in? What are your thoughts on that? I think you have to keep it simple, but not simplistic. I mean, what I mean by that is you got to add the detail you need to add. I mean, in the case of NVIDIA, for instance, you know, you need to bring in the AI business explicitly. I mean, I, I, I generally try to avoid bringing in detail that I don't need, but I have no information. But if you have information that you need to bring in investing, you need to bring it in. So if, if you're being simplistic and saying, look, I'm going to use the P ratio. It's a simple number. I can't deal with this other stuff. It's too complicated. You're being simplistic, not simple. So I think you need to bring in as much detail as you need to make an investment and nothing more. The problem I have with a lot of investors is they drown in detail, especially as they yes. get more technically proficient. The more access they have to data, it's easy to get drowned in the details and lose perspective. So you constantly have to step back and say, does it make sense for me to add that layer of detail? Does it make me a better investor? Or am I just doing this because it makes me feel better? A lot of this is psychological. You feel like you're in control when you have a lot of data and you do more work. But sometimes you've got to let that need for control go and say, look, this isn't helping me as an investor. It's making me feel more secure, more confident, but it's really doing nothing for my investor. Yeah, that's great. I think, um, I think that's a good distinction between being simple versus yeah. simplistic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so one of the other things that we actually differ on here is you don't believe in doing like a low, middle and high estimates when doing your valuation. You believe in picking, deciding, hey, I'm going to make my estimates based on growth, based on these other factors, and I'm going to stick with it. Is that accurate? And uh, if so, because I like doing low, middle, and high just to get a range of where I can see a range of values. I hate to put you on the spot, but when you go on your broker account and try to buy a stock, does yeah. it give you a low price, a middle price, <laughs> and a high price, or is it just one price? Ultimately, uh, you got to make decisions. That's true. I mean, oh. I'm open to the reality. I mean, it is true. In fact, I do these with Monte Carlo simulations that value is a distribution. That you have a base value, but you have a distribution around it. In fact, I think the low high approach is too crude. It, it's too crude because it's useless. And here's why. I'll make a prediction. You take any company, you come up with a low value, it's worth nothing. There's some scenario where the company's worth nothing okay. and high value is yeah. worth a lot. So what have you learned with your, you know, best case, worst case, other than covering your rear rent? You know who likes low, high numbers? Investment bankers. Why? Because that <laughs> way they're analysis. covered no matter what happens. So I'm not saying don't explore scenarios, don't look at the range, but ultimately you've got to accept the reality that there is a price. And you've got to have a base value, whether it comes from a distribution or a single value, you have to make a decision, buy or sell. There is no strong buy, weak buy, really weak buy. As far as I know, when I put in a, in a buy order for 10,000 shares, it is either a buy or not a buy. So I think there are a lot of, there's a lot of Weasley stuff in investing where people do things because they want to be right no matter what. And that's a luxury you have when you're an appraiser or an investment banker, but it's not your own money. When it's mm -hmm. your own money, you're either, you know, you either have to buy or not, and you have to make a decision based on a price and a value. So I don't disagree with the fact that value is a distribution. I just don't see the point of trying to come up with a low or a high unless you have this rule that you will not buy a stock 
unless the price is below your lowest value, in which case I'll make a prediction. You're going to be in cash for the rest of your life. For a long time. And really quick before you go, Mo. So in, in, in a correction, and it's sort of explaining that. The reason I like doing a low and high is my middle is usually where I say, this is where I think it's going to end up. This is my point of saying, this is where I think it'll go. My reason for picking a low and high is I want to see if it is below the low, how low is it? And if it's above the high, how overvalued? Like for example, NVIDIA is a great example. I do a range of possibilities and I don't get anywhere close to the current price, even on my optimistic assumptions. So to me, it tells me, Paul, you are just, just don't even bother on this one because it is so far out of the realm of possibility and what you see. And then if it's very low where it's even below my lowest price, okay, Paul, are you missing something other than the market's just psychology has said, we don't like the stock currently because in the short run, we're a voting machine. So I do agree with you on that sense. And I'd like to use the low and high as kind of these barometers of how far over are we and how far under are we? I, th I think there's a way to do it better. The low okay. high was the only technique we could use 40 years ago, because in a sense, you know, valuation was, you know, you, you valued a company, then to do the low, you had to change all the inputs to your worst case scenarios, and a high, you made them the best case scenarios. To begin with, the world doesn't operate in that kind of scenario. The kinds of scenarios where your revenue growth is lowest might also be the scenarios where the economy is doing badly and interest rates are much lower. So in other words, you very seldom get where every input goes to its worst case or every input goes to its best case. And 40 years ago, you said, what choice do I have? I can't be doing a hundreds of valuations with all the different combinations. Now, one of the techniques I use in valuation, is, and it used to be a lot of work, is a Monte Carlo simulation, where it's where I accept the reality. When you estimate growth, you're estimating it with error. So rather, so if you ask me what's a growth rate, and really I could give you a number, and then I'm going to wring my hands and say, you know what, I could be wrong. And you mm -hmm. know what, you should put me on the spot and say, tell me how wrong you could be. Give me a distribution for growth. It's, a, it's in a way a much more complete way of dealing with the fact that we're uncertain about our numbers. We bring in the uncertainty into the inputs. And in a simulation, you essentially run valuations over and over, drawing from your distributions. You get a distribution of value. That distribution of value will deliver what you wanted, the low and the high. But it'll also give you the 10th and the 90th percentile, the 20th and the 8th. It's, it's much more informative. Because unlike NVIDIA, most companies fall between the low and the high. But I can tell you, for instance, that Apple is at the 73rd percentile of my values. In other words, there's a 27 percent chance it's undervalued and a 73 percent chance it's overvalued. It adds layers of nuance to this uncertainty assessment. You couldn't have done it 40 years ago, but today you can have an add on to Excel. You can take any valuation you've done and make it into a simulation with almost no work. But it does require that you go back and review basic statistics on distributions and parameters. But that's something that I think all investors need to do because uncertainty is not a bug in investing. It's a feature of investing. Rather than hide from it, we should face up to it. And to face up to it, the tool that's best suited to facing up to uncertainty is statistics. And we underutilize it in investing all the time. So if you were, let's take an example here. So if you were putting a value on a company and let's say Apple, and you're just putting, let's talk about the revenue growth over the next decade. And we say that it's going to be somewhere in the range of six to 16. Let's just throw two numbers on it based on your assumptions and the way that you do things, just picking one best case. I mean, not best case, be base case. Where would you, where do you like to all error on that range? All distributions of expected values, right? So the six to 16 mm -hmm. is your range. I'm going to push you on it. You have a range of 6 to 16. Give me more mm -hmm. information. Is there a peak? In other words, is there a middle number that you think is more likely? You might say, look, I'm completely diffuse in my, in my it's good statistics we call these priors. I have no idea where it's going. To, that's called a uniform right. distribution. Your numbers could fall anywhere from 6 to 16. Your expected value then will be 11%. But right. if you say, look, I think it's more likely that it's 8 or 9%. That's where the bulk is. But there is this chance that Apple services an Apple iCar could take off. That's a 16%. And there's a chance that the next iPhone upgrade could collapse, which gives me the 6%. That's a distribution. The peak is around the 8 or 9%. There's a tail towards a 16 and a tail towards a 6. 
but I would give you an expected value that's closer to eight to nine percent than the eleven percent. That's what okay. distributions force you to do. They force you to go beyond saying, this is my low number, this is my high number, and saying, okay, tell me more. Tell me what you think about this company. And guess what? Mm -hmm. It gives you guidance as you look at the data. For me, the biggest problem we face today is we're drowning, I won't say in information, because information is, is too strong a word. We're drowning in data, qualitative data, quantitative data, opinions, estimates. What this gives you is a sense of taking that data and saying, I want to use this data to get a better sense of where between six and 16, my base mm -hmm. case should be. Is it more likely to be closer to the six or closer to the 16? That is useful assessment if you think about investing in a company. Excellent. Yeah. You know, that's something to consider because, you know, we have the software that we use and we built it ourselves. And one of the issues, like you said, is we make it basically an even distribution across, you know, we pick a low, middle, and high. We like to have the middle. You know, I basically say, okay, well, I think Apple could grow. I think it should grow around 5 or 6%. So I'll put three on the low side and a nine on the high side. When really that's probably, you know, according to what you're saying, which makes a lot of sense, yeah. is that, well, Paul, could nine really happen? Is nine enough if, if iCard and these things, services work? It could be 12, but it's more likely to be five or six. No, it, That's great. It's a, I think it's, you know, we love symmetry in our assessment. Yes, yeah, right? we, we love the normal yes. distribution. We love uniform distributions because you expected values in the middle. But, you know, I, I disagree with Nassim Taleb in many points, but one of the points he, he emphasizes over and over, the world is not a bell curve. As we discovered yeah. with COVID, yeah. you get outcomes that are extreme. And in a sense, if you don't model them into your process, you're constantly going to be surprised by these outliers when in fact they should be part of the process. With NVIDIA, the, the reason I continue to hold NVIDIA even though I found it overvalued is I do think that in the distribution, the, the, the likelihood of, a, of an extreme positive tail is greater than an extreme negative tail. Why? Because of the story you tell about NVIDIA. This is an opportunistic company. Three times in the last decade, they found a market ahead of time the gaming market, the crypto market, now the AI market, they jumped in. Third time, you can't say they're lucky. There's, there's something systematic they're doing. So the, the, the tail in this distribution comes to the fact is, hey, we don't know what the next 10 years will deliver in terms of new markets, but NVIDIA is likely to be a lead player in those markets, given their history. That's a tail in the distribution. Those tails can affect your investing decisions you might actually buy a company that's close to fairly valued if the tail of the distribution is an extreme. Those are the 10 baggers, right? So if you want to use the, 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 the verbiage of traditional value investors, I want a 10 bagger in my portfolio. The way you do it is by finding those big tails and to look for those, you've got to bring it into the data. And I want everybody to hear the other reason um, Professor Atzwaf is okay on holding NVIDIA is are you going to cry if NVIDIA goes to $150 a share? No, I mean, no of course not. You're fine with that. Yeah. And you have the emotional half discipline. My, half my holding at, one, at, at, at 4 410. And I said up front, this is to prevent that most dangerous of all emotions in investing, which is regret. Right? We've all had it. Mm -hmm. I wish I hadn't sold it. It's not the regret itself that's a problem. It's a, it's a consequence of regret because what happens when you have regret is it alters the way you invest. So yeah, I'll give course. you an example. You buy, you, let's say you sold NVIDIA at 410. It goes to, you know, it goes to 800. Your regret is, why did I sell? Yeah, nothing you can do about NVIDIA, but here's what's going to happen. The next time you have a stock that quadruples in your portfolio, you're going to say, look, I remember what happened with NVIDIA. I'm going to hold on to this stock. You're, in a sense, eating away at the heart of your investment philosophy because regret is making you do it. So yep. I don't like regret in my investing because it makes me do things I should not be doing that are inconsistent with the way I think about investing. So I would feel okay either way. Either way, I'm going to pat myself in the back. Job well done on half my, on half my holding. And for that reason, I, you know, I think sometimes making this a zero one decision being rigid in investing can actually get into trouble in the long term because you have these rules that you're so rigid on that you never break them and then you end up psychologically so mixed up as a consequence 
it ends up doing more damage than good in the long term. Yesterday, we were talking about how we wanted to speak with you about ROIC. It's something that we talk about a lot. What do you assume growth rates to be on revenue for mature businesses that, that have ROICs? Like high, Apple. High ROICs, like an Apple that has a 39%. Right which, which they can't possibly reinvest at those high rates of returns at large amounts of capital, right? right? So, you know, that's always something that we get stuck with. That's the whole, you know, how do you value, how do you put a multiple on a company that has a great ROIC and a great moat, but- They're so mature. You can't invest $100 billion of Apple's money every single year. I mean, I, I think one reason I think Apple is a single digit growth company and I own Apple and, and, I, I, and, I, and I like the company is just sheer size, near three trillion dollars, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and you've got the margins that you do and the revenues that you do. It takes a really big new business to make an impact. Yeah. I mean, that's why I didn't get excited about the Apple Watch. Even if you got a hundred percent market share of this market, it'll barely make a dent in your value. So there's a scaling effect, which I think, you know, is, is an issue. The But it's not an ROIC issue. Part of the reason I would be you know, a little wary about the ROIC for technology companies is ROIC, for better or worse, is an accounting number. It's defined by accounting measures of income and accounting measure of invested capital. And let's face it, accounting is still stuck in the 20th century. It was designed for the old time manufacturing company. It doesn't offer a job estimating invested capital at technology companies because their biggest capex, which is R&D, is ignored. And there's another big capex. Most technology companies grow through acquisitions. And if you pay for those acquisitions with shares, it kind of dissipates. You miss it completely in your invested capital because you're netting up. I mean, the accounting debris created by acquisitions is mind boggling, right? You got goodwill, you got acquisition, you know, writing off expenses. So to begin with, state, I would take, take it as a starting proposition that the return invested capital you see for technology companies is actually much higher than it real, truly is simply because you're understating invested capital. That said, though, I wouldn't be surprised if Apple's making a return on invested capital of 30, 35, 40 or 45 percent on its existing invested capital. But you're right. There aren't that many places it can go where it can keep doing it. I mean, I'll give you an example of a big market where Apple's going to be reluctant to enter, the electric car market. Does Apple have the mm -hmm. technological know-how to be a player in the electric car market? Yes. But I don't think they will enter the market because it's a capital intensive market where even if you're a great player, your return invested capital is going to drift down to 15%. That's a great return invested capital, but not for a company used to earning 35 or 40% returns on capital. It's almost like golden handcuffs. These companies have such high returns on capital that makes them reluctant to enter businesses that are capital intensive. Yeah. That's why I think Google, in spite of all the money they throw into Waymo, will not produce an electric car and become an electric car manufacturer. They don't have the stomach for assembly lines and manufacturing mm -hmm. plants and the kind of capital intensity that comes with it. So, I think that the the way I would adjust for it is rather than give the Apple a revenue growth that assumes they will enter these big markets, I give them a lower revenue growth because I don't think they can realistically enter these markets and try to keep their return on capital where it is, which they've become used to. Yeah. So I think that's where the interplay, I mean, when I think about growth margin and reinvestment assumption, they're tied together by a story. And the story can't be different for each one because it's the same company. So the story you tell us to tie those inputs together. And if you want to tell a story of high growth for Apple, it's got to be accompanied by lower returns and in invested capital. Because there is zero chance they can deliver 20% growth without entering markets that require huge amounts of capital. Same thing with banking. When Goldman Sachs introduced that card with Apple and all this talk of an Apple bank, I said zero chance of this happening. Because no matter what you think about the financial services business, it is capital intensive. Goldman Sachs might want to do it, but Apple will never want to do it. So I think that brings, uh, brings out why I think narratives are so critical when you value companies. They're not a collection of numbers. It's a story about the company that's got to make sense and tied together your different inputs. Well, that's the thing that, again, I want to reiterate, by the way, your dog's adorable. What's uh, his or her name? Her, her name is Maddie. She has to be in here because my air conditioning guy is working upstairs and she 
I love her. <laughs> I have four dogs. Um, so, you know, it's amazing because, you know, one of the things I think you'll agree with that we, that the quote unquote amateur slash retail investors, they get stuck on the story, you know, and I have a, I have a saying that I say now is that when I have somebody explain to me what they think about an investment, I say, okay, give me your thesis. And then invariably it's a story it has no tie to numbers. And I say, okay, add two zeros to your stock price. Is your story still true? Add two more zeros. Is your story still true? And if the answer is always yes, then I sit there and say, then to me, it's that investment thesis. So I want everybody to remember, you're bringing back, then the story gets attached right. to the numbers. There's still a price that's way too high to pay for even the best story in Stories the world. Stories without numbers are fairy tales. But I'll tell you, you talk oh, about professional like investors, they have the opposite problem. I'm stealing that from they you. They have numbers without stories. And numbers without stories are just spreadsheets. They're not valuations. I mean, a good valuation is a yeah. bridge between stories and numbers. I mean, as you well know that, you know, Tesla is one of those companies that I've wrestled with over the last 10 years. It is the ultimate story stuff. Yes. Because a lot of people who invest in yeah. Tesla invest purely on the story. But they want to stop at the story. Yeah. And I think it's a great story, right. an amazing story. But to be a disciplined investor, you, even if you're the ultimate optimist in Tesla, have to convert your story into numbers. Because if nothing else, it'll put guardrails on you. It'll say, look, I love Tesla at $150 per share, but not at $500 per share. Without those guardrails, you're not investing. You're just, you're yeah. just putting out a fairy tale and hoping it works out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we interviewed somebody last week <laughs> about cryptocurrency. And I I'm not going to get into the conversation with you about crypto, but you're smiling. I smiled. And he was one of the people where I said, okay, tell me. So and he kept talking about the, the greatness of crypto. I said, okay, but great. Now Bitcoin is 300,000 and 3 million. Your story is still the same. And he made some very legitimate points about the, the reason why crypto could be a good tool in the future for financial matters. But I sat there and said, I still didn't see the connection there with why Bitcoin should be X amount of dollars versus one tenth of the X amount of dollars. And that's where, you know, and that's where I probably, so let me ask you this question, your friends. I have friends, you know, recently a friend of mine, I talked to every single day said to me, oh, Paul, I'm not going to mention AI because I know you hate AI. I said, I don't hate AI. I think AI is wonderful. I think AI is going to be, has been around a lot longer than people realize and has a much brighter future. I just don't believe in overpaying for the story. So do your friends look at you and say, oh, here he goes again with his, you know, his, I can't overpay for things. Your friends uh, talk to you about investing in terms of individual companies. You probably do a better job than I do of having these conversations <laughs> with your friends than I do though. I think the first thing we need to draw is a distinction between investing and trading. Right. Investing is about finding value and buying at less than value. Ninety five percent of what passes for investing out there is trading. Trading is in, a, in many ways a much more honest game. Right. You buy at a low price, you sell at a high price. And if I ask you, why did it happen? You say, I don't care as long as I get the direction. Doesn't matter. Trading right. is about momentum and mood. So if somebody says, look, can I trade NVIDIA even though I think it's worth 240? Absolutely. Because as long as the momentum is in your favor, it doesn't matter that the value is 240. Markets are driven by mood and momentum. And we know this not just from practitioners, but from academia. The strongest force in markets that explains year-to-year -year movements in stock prices is not earnings or cash flows or growth. It's momentum. Yeah. Right. So I tell people, look, you want to trade something, at least be honest with yourself. Don't play this this game of I'm buying this for value. Don't even tell me a story about crypto taking over the world. Say, look, I'm buying Bitcoin because the momentum is with me right now. And the Bitcoin will go from 30,000 to 50,000. The momentum is right. Think of how much money you could have made if you got the momentum right on Bitcoin over the last 14 years. And we talk about that all the time. And yeah. It's funny, yesterday on Twitter, I said something and somebody said to me, um, you're wrong, Paul, as long as you're deploying capital into something, it's an investment. I said, okay, well, you know, I didn't want to get into that exactly. You know, Professor Oswald, you're, you're definitely shaking your head because that's not true. And, um, and uh, you know, that's, that's something that really struggle with a lot when I talk to people is, and, and I've gotten way better at it since we've had our channel grow to 200,000 subscribers, just having a conversation with people and saying, hey, trade till you're blue in the face. But the hard part is, People have a hard time separating the company with the stock. So when I say I'm not interested in buying Tesla, they assume I don't like Tesla. 
Meanwhile, I've owned a Tesla. Mo owns a Tesla. It's funny. I say there's a difference between, I love, I think Ferrari is the ultimate moat. In my opinion, Ferrari is the ultimate moat business. This is a, a company that's done a great job having exclusivity, been around a long time and charges whatever they want. And then when people buy their cars, you're they not, go up in value. I mean, car with and it, you're buying a feeling, correct. right? I mean, that's what you get, yeah, right? You wanted to be, you're, thir- you're 45 years old. You, bought, you wanted to be a race car driver when you were 16. Yeah. This is the closest you're going to get to that. So it is, it, and that feeling can't be recreated as long as they don't get too ambitious. And this is the point I make about you know, yeah. about about luxury companies, right? Luxury goods, you could argue, you know, it's a, there is this this uh, this patina about them. You're not buying a a Gucci bag. You're buying you're being, becoming part of an exclusive club. But you know what? The club, problem yeah. for that club to stay exclusive, you can't have this sold to everybody. So in a sense. Of the course. minute Ferrari says we're going to go for 10% revenue growth, which they can, right? Let's face it, Ferrari, if they wanted to, could have 10, 20, 30, 30% revenue growth. They will undercut the basis of their existence. Most luxury product companies have lost that Ferrari ness because they've gone for a hey, we want to be big companies. The most successful luxury product companies in, Italy, in, in Europe are the companies that are family owned that have said we're not going to get that ambitious, we're going to stay small. You know, the Ferragamos uh, they were both students in my class there, you know, in my in the 1990s. And when they were students in my class, Ferragamo was a small niche luxury Italian, you know, uh, style seller, selling of style, whatever they were selling, whether it was styles or something else. Right. Now there are Ferragamos everywhere. Doesn't mean that it's a bad decision, but now you're selling something else. It's a different kind of product. You're exposed to different risks. But I think that, you know, I have a matrix where I ask people what they think about a company. And then I say, I want you to think about what the market thinks about the company. What you're looking for is a mismatch. If you think a company is awesome and the market also thinks it's awesome, it's a match. You're paying the price. You want a company where what you think about the company is mismatched with what the market thinks and you're right and the market is wrong. It's always add that qualifier, right? Because the market could be right and you're wrong. Investing is about mismatches, finding those mismatches and waiting for the market to come around to your point of view. You might have to wait a long time, but I think it separates what you think about a company from what you think of it as an investment. And you know, for people watching who watch our channel, we call those mispricings, which is the same thing as the mismatch. It's the market is saying, this thing is garbage. And you're saying, well, maybe not. And hopefully eventually over time they can drive it. You know. We heard one of your videos. And so I used to teach at my high school just for fun, uh, this investing class. I remember talking about how it was hard for me to find investments. One of the kids raised her hand and she said, so Paul, if it, what happens if this company stays expensive forever? They never buy it. And everybody started laughing. And I said, no, they never buy it. And it was amazing that they couldn't get around the idea that it's okay just to not no. own something. You know what I mean? And, and, that's, and that's something we've heard you say uh, recently. You said, hey, if I have to wait 16 years, I'm going to wait 16 years. And we are fully comfortable with that. But that's part of the psychology that you see with people out there forcing themselves to pull the trigger because, well, you know, I guess 25 times earnings for Ferrari is okay because they really can increase revenue 30% if they want to, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if you want to expand on that no, a little I, bit as well. I think that uh, I'll give you an example. Things are expensive where you're not going to see an adjustment of value. Sports franchises. There's zero chance of course, that the Washington yes. Redskins are worth six billion yeah. plus. Zero chance as a business. But you know what? As long as the number of billionaires exceeds the number of sports franchises, this is a pricing game, right? Yeah. They're going to buy it as an expensive toy. So if you went in and said, I'm going to sell short on the Redskins, assume you could actually sell short on a sports franchise, you will go bankrupt. So that's a classic example. I call these trophy assets where there will be no convergence. And I think as investors, we need to be honest as well. Investing is an article of faith. Why? Because we're assuming that in the long term, price will converge to value, but we can't prove it. That's why equity arbitrage is an oxymoron. There is no point in time 
when things where there's a reckoning. Fixed income arbitrage works because with bonds, there is a date of maturity where if you misprice, things go away. Equity can be mispriced and stay mispriced forever. And as investors, we have to say, well, we believe that price will adjust to value. But if somebody says, can you prove it? No. And that's why investing is faith. And if you don't have that faith, you know what happens? You become a trader. Many people start their lives as investors. But after their faith is tested five, six, seven times, they finally say, look, you know, this is pointless. I'm going to become a trader. Most portfolio managers who claim to be value investors, if you look at what's in their portfolio, oh, are trading, right? And oh, that, I think, is what I have a problem with. I have no problem with the people who are traders or open about the fact that they look at charts and technical indicators. I have complete respect for them because they're playing the game openly. What I don't have much time for are these portfolio managers who talk about value and talk about how they care about cash flows. And they look at the top 10 stocks in their portfolio. They're all momentum stocks. And so how the heck did that happen? Yeah. Right? Stop masquerading as investors if you're trading. Be honest with yourselves. It'll make you a better trader. Right now, you're handicapping yourself by acting like you're investing when, in fact, you're trading. And it's a very, very kind. I know you haven't Extremely watched our common. videos. We talk about it all the time because we, Mo actually does a lot of trading. He's taught me trading. And I find it to be very fascinating and very exciting to not care. You know, oh, great. I'm going to buy Bitcoin and go long in Bitcoin. Why? Because the charts told me to. You know, well, Paul, I thought you don't like Bitcoin. This doesn't matter. It's completely irrelevant. I don't care. You know, Aswat, there's a lot of times that people will send me a ticker symbol for, in respect to trading. And they're like, do you know what this company does? And I, I have no idea what this yeah. company does. Nor do I, care. I don't really care what this company does. I'm trading momentum and, and right now. I think now. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the essence. I mean, my favorite show to be on CNBC is Fast Money, when you've got those traders on. Oh, yeah. We're open about the fact that they trade and about absolute contempt for value. And I say, I, I get where you guys are coming from. I know uh, we disagree, but at least we're being open about what drives what we do. I think, you know, the, you know the, what investors need is to be honest with themselves. Self-delusion is the most dangerous quality when you're investing. So I've seen you speak a lot about CEOs saying that a lot of CEOs are th not the right CEO for the position that they have. And it's something that we've said a lot too. I mean, a lot of CEOs in Fortune 500 companies started in sales, worked their way up, and now they're in a CEO position where capital allocation matters so much. What do you see as a right CEO for a company? Yeah. And then I want to ask you about a specific CEO company, after that. Right? I mean, you're a young startup. You want a visionary because you're selling a story. The story drives the numbers. You don't want somebody who's a nuts and bolts guy who can get the, you know, as you build biz the business up, you know, the business building skills. You know, you don't want a CEO who's all vision all the time mm -hmm. and doesn't spend time on supply chains and manufacturing as you get to be a and if you're a mature company, you want a CEO who plays defense, right? Because that's what you're doing. You know, in fact, you don't want a visionary there because they get you into trouble. They go to after markets that are unreachable. They spend money on things they shouldn't be spending money on. And if you're a declining company, you want somebody with absolutely no ambition, which is tough to find, right? CEOs are people who climb through the ranks. It is. That's why I use Larry the liquidator from other people's money as my, you know, Danny DeVito running your company when, because your end game here is to dismantle the company. And who wants to be known as a CEO? I mean, like Winston Churchill you know, said, he didn't want to be known as the person who's dismantled the British Empire. No CEO wants to be the person who dismantled a company like GE. But you know what? GE would have benefited from somebody in 2007 or 8 who came in and said, it's been, a, it's been a great run, 120 years, but it's time to start breaking this company down, selling off the pieces. But they didn't. And by the time they got to it 10 years later, yeah. it was in a sense too late to do. Right. So what do you think about Elon Musk as CEO? I mean, I would categorize him as a visionary now running a what is it, $800 billion company right now? And yeah, but I don't look at it as $800 billion. I don't look at the market cap. I look at the revenue perspective of, of Tesla saying... What's that revenue growth? I mean, the market's going to assign whatever market cap is going to assign, but what's the revenue? So do you think, think he's good for the my position promise, he's in not with this, you know, Obviously, he's got vision coming out of every orifice in his body, more vision than the next 100 CEOs put together. I think he gets easily distracted, and we all know it. Even people who, who are, yeah. are Musk fans know it. And when you're running a trillion-dollar company, you 
cannot afford those distractions to hurt your business. So in a, in a sense, you know, what, whatever you think about Elon and Twitter, it's in a sense been a distraction from Tesla and it could seep back and affect mm -hmm. Tesla and you don't want that to happen. I think that uh, there, there is a, an intermediary solution because I, you know, I think Tesla without Musk is worth a lot less because of the fact that it's a, it's a traded stock, it's driven by momentum and a lot of the people who are driving it are people who are, who are investing in Elon, not in Tesla. The intermediate solution yeah. is what happened at Apple when Steve Jobs had his second coming, which is, you know, you take care of the vision, let somebody take care of the operations and give that person the power to make those operating decisions, not just having a COO. And it's easy to hire somebody, you're the chief operating officer, but give them the power to make operating decisions. I think a division of labor at Tesla would make both sides happy. I think Elon, I, and I can't imagine Elon Musk sitting in on a three hour supply chain meeting, to be quite honest, you bored five minutes in. Yeah. So right. let somebody right. else do that grunt work of building a business because Tesla's next phase is going to be business building because they've got to increase the number of cars they sell from what 600,000 less than a million to 10 million 12 million and that'll take a lot of work and a lot of grunt work at that the company that owns my brain the most is amazon because i look at this company and we have a great visionary in jeff bezos we have a company that doesn't make the most amazing margins in fact in the last few years 100% of their profit has come from AWS, right. which is, you know, I tell people, I'm like, listen, this company doesn't make money selling stuff. They're like, oh, come on. I'm like, yeah, go. I mean, it has in the past. It's getting back to it. I look at Amazon and actually it's one of the few companies I say, large companies I say too hard pile for me. Like, I just don't understand the numbers of it. I can't come up with a semblance of a value because I look at it going, I, I don't know. I mean, are the gross margins correct? Some people argue with me on gross margins saying, no, Paul, the gross margin of 13% that you say is incorrect. It's actually 24%. I'm like, well, I get, so talk to me about how I'm completely missing Amazon because I literally put in the two, there's very rarely that I say too hard. I came, if you couldn't tell me if $10 is the right price or 150, I just don't know. Well, there is one story that 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 if you're if you're not if you're upbeat on Amazon and is an investor you would take, but it's a story you don't want as a, as a consumer, or as a member of society, which is what I call the Thanos story, which is Amazon uh. is the ultimate destructive force. Every business it enters, you never know whether Amazon will make money. But one thing I can guarantee you, everybody else in that business will make less money or lose money. And it's been true every business they've entered. The day they bought Whole Foods, a collective market cap of all of the other publicly traded grocery companies dropped by $50 billion. So this has been Amazon's pathway here is enter business after business in a sense as a destructive force. And the Thanos story is eventually there will be no place to go but Amazon. And then they will raise prices and your know, Amazon Prime will go from 129 to 12,999. And there's not a whole lot you can do because there's no place to go. It's a scary concept. And it's a concept where there's actually a plausible pathway. The only preventive force is regulation and government because everybody else wants Amazon to fail. This is, you might get crocodile tears from other companies talking about government regulation, but they want Amazon stop because they can't stop it themselves. So to me, the biggest danger in the Thanos story is governments are not going to sit back and let this happen. They're going to be regulation. They're going to be restrictions. So it's Thanos with maybe the Iron Man as, as, as kind of the force that pulls the power away. So that's the up. The downbeat story is that a field of dreams company. They've always been a field of dreams company, which is they tell self investors in the notion. If we build it, revenues, they will come. The profits will come. Just trust us. And we've trusted them for 25 years and it hasn't worked. As you said, AWS is kind of the side game. The main game, which is online retail, it's still the same story, just on a much huger scale. There, I think it becomes difficult to sustain value. And you know, Jeff Bezos is, you know, you've got to give him credit, has been the most consistent storyteller in history. He's told the same story for Amazon. You go back to the 1997 letter that he gave, sent Amazon investors about what Amazon is going to go. You look at what Amazon did in his stint, they stayed consistent and they acted consistently with that story. But as I watch Jeff 
you know, running around the world in many, you know, in 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 in, uh, in speedos and hanging out in <laughs> yachts. Hey, if he has, if he's got visions, I don't think the visions have anything to do with Amazon anymore. I truly believe that he's he's walked away from the company which you know which he built, and that you know Andy Jessup is 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 been given the reins, and this is going to be the test for him because he doesn't have the history that Bezos has with the market. And whether investors will have the patience with a new CEO that they don't know and don't trust is really the question. In the last year and a half or two years, you've seen the effects of that. Hey, somebody else is running the company. What if they don't pull it off? Because that's a plausible scenario as well. So maybe this is one of those scenarios when you look at the possible valuations, you're going to get a huge range of value and massive disagreement about where the stock is going. And that, as an investor, for some people might say, look, I don't want to go there. There are too many outcomes here which are, you know, no. But this is why I think diversification, spreading your bets, allows you to do more things than being concentrated. I've always argued against these five stock, 10 stock portfolios where you go for the 10, because then you can't buy an Amazon. I don't know whether you can buy an NVIDIA, you know. Diversification gives me the freedom to invest in Amazon because the Thanos story is a plausible path and I could potentially then make money on that story. I couldn't do that if Amazon was one of eight or nine stocks that I owned. And I want everybody to hear that because you, as you know, every investor does it differently. That's what we love about investing. You know, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger say diversification is for the people who don't understand things. And and- I want to pause you right there. Please but do. Berkshire Hathaway is a very diversified. Spread, yes, a, has always spread its bets. In fact, you now when Charlie Munger this year got questioned at Berkshire Hathaway about Apple becoming a disproportionate part of his portfolio, you know somebody brought my name up as, as 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 why they framed the question as me asking you know raising this issue. I don't know. He said something very interesting. He said essentially, "I it doesn't matter," and. If I had the chance to ask a follow-up question here, my question would have been, you're 97 years old, maybe it doesn't matter now. Would you have given me the same answer when you were 67 years old? Because the shorter your time horizon, the less it uh, matters. Yeah, or you can matter. go for these, you can say, look, what difference does it make? Right. You start stretching out time horizons. You gotta be careful about concentrating your bets and hoping they pay off because you have too much riding on every single choice you make. It, I think, paralyzes people on investing. No, and I and I agree with that. And the, the, my whole point about it was, I personally like diversification. And the reason being is, for me, I want to sit there and say, listen, I like the, you know, I have a list on my phone of stocks I want to own forever. And it's 30, 35 companies wide. And I just sit there and say, the great part for me is, I can write cash secured puts and make returns while I wait for the stocks to hit the prices. And if I get to buy them, awesome. If I don't buy them, okay, that's fine. I look at it saying it gives me a wide range and let the runners run because I'm going to own them for a long period of time. And if they they run, great. The way they end up being in my portfolio, I have no idea what it's going to be. Maybe someday it's like Apple and it's four. There's one company that's 40% of my portfolio because I caught a $30 billion company that grew to $300 billion. Okay. You know, that's where I always tell people, find what makes sense to you. If you want to own no more than 10 stocks, because you're fine doing very detailed research and saying, I'm going to own these. But if you sit there and say, like for me, I always tell people, the average investor is a 10,000 foot view. Maybe somebody I know personally, we, we, we know very well, he's a five foot view. I'm more of the 100 to 200 foot view. I'm going to get involved with the financials. I'm going to look at things. I'm going to read the 10K. That's pretty much where I'm going to stop and say, if I can't buy it for a price that's reasonable to me at that point, then I'll just wait. And then eventually I will get it because I don't believe every stock is overvalued forever. I just don't. Markets are going to go through cycles. And there's a, there's, a, there's a reason I spread my bets because the word, the minute you use the word diversify, people freak out because it's, oh, that, they, they, when you say diversify, they go to index fund. There's no mm-hmm. middle ground for them. Five stocks are index fund. There are 47,000 publicly traded stocks. I have about 40 in my portfolio right now. That's being pretty picky, 40 out of 47,000. So it's not like I'm spreading my bets over everything. I'm spreading my bets over 40 companies accumulated over time across countries, across geographies, across sectors. It takes care of multiple issues. 
But for me, the reason I diversify is I want to pass the sleep test. Yep. What that effectively means is I don't want to lie at night wondering what my portfolio will do tomorrow or what it did that day. That to me undercuts the entire notion of living well. You invest to preserve and grow your wealth. You don't invest to give yourself ulcers. You don't invest to give yourself a heart attack 10 years ahead of time because you're so concerned about what your portfolio did that day that you cannot stop thinking about it. I could have a stock drop 30% in my portfolio. I don't lose a moment of sleep because if, if it happens because it's not 30% of my portfolio. Because if it were, then I'm looking at lifestyle changes I have to make because something in my portfolio did badly. So I think that you've got to decide what matters for you in life. And investing can't be the center of your universe. I mean, can, because if it is, then I think you've lost perspective completely. Yeah. Is 40 your ideal number of equities in a portfolio? I can answer that. Or, can I answer that for you real quick? Or do you not have one? I'm going to say he doesn't have one. He's going to buy what makes the most sense at any given time. I'll tell you why I need 40. I buy a lot of young companies. I buy a lot of companies. The more mature your companies become, the smaller the number you need mm -hmm. to get past the sleep test. So mm -hmm. if all you're buying are Kraft Heinz and Coca-Cola, you can get away owning 15 or 20 stocks because in a sense, buying microcosms of the market where there's no great upside, no great downside, you're effectively going for them. I think that this is why when, when you take lessons from old value investors and try to extrapolate, you've got to be careful. Now, Ben Graham might have said 10 stocks are okay, but you know what he bought? Phone companies, railroads, essentially companies that were already mature companies where there was no more upside surprise or downside surprise waiting. And I think Ben Graham actually liked diversification, by the way. Yeah, but I'm saying that you know, but when you look at lessons that emerge out of old time value investing, oh, gotcha. somewhere okay. along the way became one of those lessons. Got it. And I think that those lessons of concentration were built around these mature company portfolios in a mature economy. That's the other thing to emphasize. The US in the 20th century was an outlier, a mean reverting predictable economy. You got mature companies in a mean reverting predictable economy you can get away with 10 stocks in your portfolio. I don't think you can do that even with mature companies today because the world has become a much more volatile place. So I think in a sense, as we globalize, as risks increase in terms of macro risk versus micro risk, you have no choice but to spread your bets. Yeah, and by the way, to your point, Berkshire now owns 90 companies free and clear, has a diverse portfolio of stocks. It's, you know, yes, Apple is the biggest portion of those stocks, but people always forget there's eight, there's 90 wholly owned companies in Berkshire Hathaway that are spitting right. out tens of billions of dollars in cash flow every single year and that we don't a, see their and, values. And it's nice to have life day, a, a, a time horizon set by the actuarial tables rather than by clients. Correct. The advantage that Berkshire Hathaway has always had over a portfolio manager is Geico money coming in as part of the investment capital. And luckily, actuary tables don't panic. That's why, yep. you know, they, they can buy Goldman Sachs in November of 2008 without batting an eye. No portfolio manager who had to answer to clients on December 31st of that year would have been able to do the same thing. Yep. So... I heard something interesting about you. You don't believe like everybody else in reading, 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 because you think sitting in with your own thoughts is ver something very important and not listening to every other person's word. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? It's very, it's different from what we hear out there in the mainstream. I think it, when you have a question, you should at least try to answer it yourself first, based on your framework, your way of thinking before you go looking for other people's answers. The problem when you, when you start reading up the answers to questions is they get embedded in your brain and they short circuit your thinking, right? So I think that you got to give yourself a chance. And in a, in a sense, 40 years ago, you had no choice, right? You didn't have Google search on, you weren't on a desktop. You couldn't go to the library and just pick up three books. You had to actually think for answers. I call this the Google search curse, which is, you have a question, you know the easiest way to find the answer, go and Google search, so what tax rate should I use in valuation? It's easy, it 
you know, it saves you time, but it prevents you from thinking through the answer to that question. And I think we've lost something as a consequence. I find that people's understanding of things is much more surface level now because the way you learn something is you get stuck, you try to figure your way out of being stuck. And that's how knowledge gets embedded. That's a basis for learning. And we're doing it less and less because it's so easy to look up other people's answers to questions. So I do think we need to think more and read less. Doesn't mean we shouldn't read, but I think mm -hmm. if you spend, if you keep you know, boasting about how many books you read last month, you know, I think in a sense you might be missing the point. If the point is not to accumulate the numbers of books you read, but to actually advance your learning. And if you know, those books will help you advance learning, go ahead. If not, you're just well read, not well learned. So I want everybody again who's watching to to hear this because it's like like Mo said, it's very different than what, you know, I'm an avid reader. I'm an avid thinker. Sometimes I sit in the car. It's a combination of both. I think the issue that you bring up that's really great is if you're not, I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with, are you able to be an independent thinker in general? You know, I'm like, we're hearing you today and there's some things you set up like, oh, I never really thought of it that way. And other things I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I agree with that anyhow. And, uh, you know, the one fundamental thing though is all value investors sound very similar. They're not gonna have the same process and everything. Seth Klarman's different than Warren Buffett, different than you, different than all these people. And that's what I always wanna, that's why we do these interviews. We want, you know, we've, we've, we've interviewed Monish Pabrai and his methods are very different than you and I. I mean, even when we interviewed him, he once said something about Microsoft and I made some joke and I was like, well, if Microsoft was $30, you'd buy that. He's like, well, of course I would. I said, okay. So the whole point I'm making is we can all look at things differently, but our fundamental beliefs, I think you'd agree as value investors are the same. We're trying to buy something for less money than, than we think it's the market actually, for the, than it would be worth in the long run. And I like your comment. I like your talk about 40 stocks because I personally like owning more things. I don't want to have, you know, five stocks. I want to be able to say, oh, great. I have 27 stocks. And suddenly LVMH, Louis Vuitton fell by 90% because Bernard um, was found dead. In his, and I'm not trying to say that I want that, but all of a sudden it falls. Great. I'm going to buy some Louis Vuitton. Yeah. And never said never. I mean, that, the never, of course. You know, I, I've heard people say, I will never buy this stock. I will at the right price. Of course. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to buy anything. So yep. when people say, I will never buy a money losing company, I will never buy a, a company where, you know, it, it, you're missing the point that the right price, you have a good investment. At the wrong price, I don't care how great a company is, you have a bad investment. You know, but I think that, um, you know, rigidity is, is the enemy of good investing. You've got, and, and you've got to accept the fact that we're all human. We all have yep. our blind spots. Knowing your blind spots is a critical part of being a good investor. Warren Buffett has his blind spots. That's sacrilegious. He has his blind spots. <laughs> of course he does. And yeah. I think that, well, he that we've got to accept that, that even the greatest investors sometimes do things that really don't make sense. They say things that don't make sense. You got to be willing to say, you know what? I disagree with Warren Buffett on that. I think that Charlie Munger was wrong on that. And it's not that, I mean, I have a great deal of respect for both, both men, but it, it doesn't mean that I'm going to take anything they say as religion. I think that you need to, be, as you said, be able to think for yourself. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much again for your time. And uh, maybe we'll follow back up with you next year and we can do it again. Okay, sounds good. Take care. Thank, thank you very much, Professor. Bye-bye. Take care. I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast with Aswath. It was an absolute pleasure. and He's welcome back anytime. I'm dropping his link below. Go ahead and click that. He has so much free material. He really doesn't like to charge outside of his NYU class for anything that he thinks or puts out there. One of my favorite things he said, I'm very content with where I am at life. I don't need to make more money. And that is such a great thing. So he has so much free information out there, writing, videos, you name it. Go check it out below and we'll see you guys next time.